Namaskar to everyone. Uh, good morning. Um, uh, I really welcome you all to this very important session. A very warm welcome to all the eminent speakers here today. Uh, my special thanks to Dr. Prabodh Seth, who will be joining us later. Uh, I want to start with a few uh, facts um, that, that I have basically noted down. 2.21% uh, of the total Indian population lives with a disability. The World Health Organization estimates that 15% of the world's population lives with some kind of disability. As COVID-19 sweeps the world, persons with disabilities are at a higher risk of serious illness. The lockdown disproportionately affected persons with disabilities in comparison to the non-disabled population. The concept of social distancing which is fundamental in controlling the sped, spread of coronavirus cannot be emulated by a person with disabilities, as many cannot perform even the most basic of activities, such as hand washing, personal hygiene, independently. Persons with intellectual disabilities are also highly dependent on their caretakers and attendants who have not been able to, and some have been able to get the passes to come to them, and some have not uh, been able to. And they also, uh, there is a trust that is built with the caretakers. It's difficult to build that trust with somebody new. Hence, the person with disabilities, uh, it is a critical time, both at a personal and professional front. I'm sorry if I'm a little uh, emotional on this or, uh, you know, nervous on this because I had a, you know, the fantastic words written by Bablinji and Fiki uh, to help me with this welcome address. But uh, because this is something so close to us, uh, we've been working at it since we started our uh, diversity and inclusion task force. Fiki, I have to thank, as an apex body uh, and industry association of India, has always advocated the cause of inclusive nation building. And in fact, today's initiative is being held under the aegis of Fiki's task force on diversity and inclusion, which has a dedicated subgroup on empowering people with disabilities, chaired by Nipun, who is moderating today, and uh, me and Radhika Piramal, other uh, co-chairs under the mentorship of my mother, Dr. Jyotna Suri. Uh, we have three uh, subgroups. One is on gender parity, the other is on LGBTQ, uh, which is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. And the third, which is why we're here today, is on empowering its people with disabilities. The group has been working towards assessing the current DNI scenario in the organization to identify a roadmap and to build the existing gap. The task force has already submitted the representations on the impact of COVID-19 on persons with disabilities to the Ministry of Social Justice and empowerment, as well as certain state governments. An appeal has also been sent to FIKI members, especially from pharma sector and e-commerce sector, to offer priority home delivery services to the customers with disabilities and other vulnerable sections, and to also consider announcing a special helpline, which has happened, because I know that Nippon has also uh, started a helpline uh, the, to prioritize these facilities. An advisory is also being sent to them uh, to be considered on aspects towards vulnerable sections while formulating their post-COVID survival and revival strategies, which is exceedingly important because the new world that we're building and the new normal that we're doing, I hope that we, you know, do not carry the same mistakes of the previous world. And all the hard work that diversity and inclusion has happened and we've all worked together uh, to make sure that we champion these causes, uh, I hope water is not being spilled all over them. Basis this, today's discussion will focus on immediate, medium, and long-term impact on the ongoing health crisis and talk about the specific support needed from the government and industry to mitigate any challenges and risks that people with disabilities are facing due to the prevailing uncertainty. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to do the welcome address. Over to you, Nipun. Yeah. Uh, Nipun, before you join in, just uh, one announcement I wanted to uh, make uh, to all our participants. 
uh, that we also have with us Ms. Surbhi Taneja today, uh, who's interpreting uh, for the benefit of uh, all our uh, hearing impaired uh, peers and colleagues who've joined us today. Uh, so um, I hope you all can see her. And you can also pin by clicking on the screen and selecting the name Surbhi Taneja uh, in lock video view so that you can see the interpreting going on. Yeah, over to you, Nipun. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Umarji, and uh, thank you so much, Kesha, for uh, the wonderful introduction. It's really, uh, and thank you so much, everybody who's attending. Apologies for the technical glitch last time because of which we could not go live. And uh, I think uh, Mr. Kesha Suri has done an excellent job in already summing up the challenges persons with disabilities face. And he's not left really left much for me to speak, but uh, just, uh, but you know, what what I would have hoped for was to give an introduction to Mr. Kesha Suri and the wonderful work he has himself been doing during this time. So you know. Before I start off and talk about persons with disabilities, I would like to say that, you know, I think we all have been inspired by our own chair who's uh, given us hotels for medical staff, who's been feeding hundreds, hundreds, if not thousands of LGBTQ people during this lockdown and doing a wide variety of things for them. Uh, but today is about persons with disabilities, so I'll focus more on disability and what are the challenges persons with disabilities face. As uh, Mr. Sudhi said, we've already sent uh, a kind of bu a bulletin on the impact persons with disabilities face and, uh, and what Fiki's views really on this are to both the Ministry of Social Justice and to various state governments. Uh, some of the issues that we've highlighted, which uh, Mr. Suri already said, but I'll just uh, tap into them again very briefly, include social distancing and the challenges persons with disabilities face. Uh, the fact that uh, caretakers in attendance cannot get uh, passes and I think uh, now a lot of caretakers and attendants have actually started getting passes since we sent that notification. But another challenge has already started where especially in areas that are red or in containment, the attendant or caretaker is not physically managing to reach the person with a disability even if he or she has a pass because public transportation has been totally stopped in those particular areas. A third challenge persons with disabilities are facing at this time is really access to groceries especially for persons with disabilities who are living alone and who cannot access the market to get these groceries. Uh, these are some of the challenges. Apart from that, there are of course various other challenges and I, we have experts on the panel with us who are more equipped than me to answer them. But uh, very briefly, technology is, in a, is a challenge with a lot of companies are shifting to work from home. Our companies adopting technologies that are really accessible to persons with disabilities. Uh, the role of HR is another big challenge and uh, we'll have another later speaking about that because when companies start cutting costs, there's, uh, there are layoffs and et cetera, our persons with disability is more vulnerable. Uh, the blind have their own challenge, challenge too, where we have the use an expert. But I'm going to start off with Karishma and talk about technology and how technology can play a role in persons with disabilities. I'll be asking her two or three questions and then uh, after that I'll go to Nidhi and then to Aradna. Uh, but of course, the, the house is open for questions from the audience too. You can just type in your questions and I'll take your questions in the end after I've covered all three of them. Uh, so firstly, thank you so much Karishma for joining us. Karishma is the Senior Manager of Business Operations and Accessibility at uh, Microsoft. She's a double master from Symbiosis Institute of Management Studies and NLS Bangalore. And uh, she's really been leading all the accessibility initiatives at Microsoft. And I think she is the best person to talk about technology in that sense. So Karishma, my first question to, really is, uh, to you really is that a lot of companies are shifting to work from home and adopting various technologies to do so in the process. What challenges could persons with disabilities face and what can be done by organizations to ensure that they are not left behind at this stage? Hi, Nipun. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that question. And uh, first of all, let me thank Mr. Suri Uma uh, for uh, organizing this uh, wonderful forum where we all can get together, interact and discuss challenges as well as the opportunities that we have ahead of us because uh, I think we all understand in times of crisis is when we actually get better opportunities, we can work harder, innovate, uh, and come out with uh, uh, some great innovations that can actually help everyone, um, whether person with a permanent, temporary, or situational disability. Having said that, uh, to answer your question, um, I think we all recognize that these are unprecedented times. And uh, each one of us uh, have been struggling, whether uh, we talk of disability, uh, I think in some form or shape, the situation has disabled each one of us. Working from home um, was at one point uh, a luxury, a benefit that the organizations, multinationals and corporates were giving to their 
people, uh, their employees, and it was a benefit. But today, it's uh, a compulsion and a way of life. That's a new normal. We all have adopted to it. The organizations, each one of us, are just being uh, confined into our homes, and, and, and we have adopted to this new style of working through technology. And as I said, I mean, humans have this uh, tendency to adapt quickly, and we create opportunities in the times of challenges. And how technology has come to our rescue is amazing. There are several uh, technology platforms today that are allowing us to seamlessly collaborate with each other, work from home, uh, just consume content, create what we want to. And, and I know initially uh, it took time, especially in a country like India, where this is, uh, as I said, it has not been a very, very normal situation to work from home, not even was uh, accepted by a lot of people. But now, gradually, it is becoming a norm. More than ever, uh, I think accessibility is a need of VR, irrespective of whatever disability we talk about. Uh, we all need tools and technologies. I'll just give you an example. I am a working mother. I have a five-year-old child. Um, I need to, of course, uh, in the current scenario, need to uh, make sure that all my household chores are taken care of. I'm uh, attending to my professional work, and also I'm attending to my daughter at the same time. So there are so many technologies today that are keeping me going. I'll just give you a small example. Immersive Reader is one of the amazing tools. It just, just helps me if I have to just go and read a long email or a document. I can continue to work while just put the Immersive Reader on and the document and the computer starts to read me the document and I can do two things at the same time. So I think not only it is helping a person with disability, but all of us, as I said, need accessible tools today to work in the environment that we are living in. So it's, it's absolutely uh, making my life easy. I, I can give my own example. Uh, Teams is another uh, collaboration platform that's from, uh, that is obviously because I'm from Microsoft, I can talk of that, but there are many uh, out there in the market and today it has made us easy it has made easy for all of us to just uh, get on a call, get on a video, as uh, have, have these meetings, have webinars, get connected, create content, consume content, share content with each other. Um, of course, uh, there are things that cannot uh, beat meeting in person, but in the given scenario, I think this is the best way we can actually uh, communicate, contact, talk to each other, and, and stay connected. A small uh, example, I can uh, another example that I can give you of technology that is helping me personally is uh, in these times especially, I think we need to continuously upskill ourselves. Uh, there are challenges that we are seeing. There, there are uh, there are scare of jobs. People are uh, people are wondering what is going to happen to the economy. How are we going to uh, save our own jobs. At the same time, I think it's important for us to continuously upskill ourselves, which means we have an opportunity to train ourselves by taking a lot of online trainings, which I am doing currently uh, for myself. And I think there are technologies uh, that just simply helps you to, uh, again, as I said, doing multiple jobs at the same time while I'm maybe feeding my daughter a breakfast, I can just uh, switch on my computer and it can read out to me there is a training that is going on or the presentation, the content that I'm supposed to consume, it just reads aloud to me. And I am easily doing multiple things at the same time. So, so I think that's how the technology is empowering all of us in these times. And these are the times we can think creatively, innovate, and um, just make use of these inclusive technologies which have been created keeping everyone in mind and automatically solving for persons with disability. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Karishma. Karishma, do you think work from home is here to stay even post the virus? And do you think in that there's a silver lining for persons with disabilities that more jobs might open up for them because of uh, more companies adopting work from home and technology being adopted? Great question, Nipun. Um, I think, as I said, uh, many organizations today are, uh, they actually never believed in the idea of work from home, especially Indian organizations. Um, this situation has created a wide acceptability of this concept. And simply, like hygiene was never taken seriously. And today, I think it is saving lives. 
we would have never washed our hands ever before the the times that we are doing today it's 20 or 30 times a day and that's it is it is helping us to save ourselves so hygiene is becoming so important so i think similarly uh, we are living in this changing world and we are operating very differently work from home is getting widely accepted and definitely this will create uh, i feel this will create more opportunities for persons with disability more specifically i think people with mobility issues because they would have faced maximum challenge from traveling to from location a to b and today work from home is enabling them and can enable them to work from wherever they are and in fact it is not just uh, the dependencies are also changing disability is becoming an important business imperative organizations have started to realize that the organizations that are leading the disability employment and inclusion uh, charter have seen actually higher revenue and profit margin increase in 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 their organizations and this has been proven by studies like what accenture did in 2018 which actually suggested that on an average <clears throat> over a period of 4 years they saw 28% higher revenue and double the net income 30% higher economic profit margins than their peers of the organizations who actually employed persons with disabilities so as i said the shift is also happening at the same time the organizations realize that there is a talent pool out there over a billion people across the globe one which is an untapped talent and then also it helps to form companies better and in the current scenario where we are talking about restricting ourselves from working from home it should open up more and more opportunities for persons with disabilities who have had to face challenges before right i think that's a very optimistic uh, note uh another challenge a lot of persons with disabilities are facing are in terms of schooling because a lot of schools are sort of shifting in fact all schools are really shifted to educating from home and uh, because of which there's really a lack of access to special educators i know technology can play a lot of uh, play a big role in enabling students during such a time but do you think there's a case for uniform guidelines on working with students with disabilities at the moment because a lot of schools are not using the accessible technologies in that sense and can you also briefly tell the audience about how accessible technologies can help students with disabilities absolutely i think this is a very very relevant question in the current times remote learning is so as i was saying it is not just about students with disabilities or people with disabilities it is about everybody today students are restricted at home they can't attend classes they can't go to schools so remote learning is becoming the need of the hour and it is what can inclusive technologies do they can not only just help us uh, get our special educators trained i think it is important for all teachers all educators around the world to understand how inclusive technologies work because i think they cannot be a better time than today when all of uh, uh, all students all children are connected online to be in an inclusive environment where uh, ability disability language all kind of barriers go away because we are all connected to the same medium which is technology so so i think it is very very important that we have uh, technology bridge that gap of special and inclusive education by having all teachers to understand how to work with these technologies microsoft has one of the greatest tools uh, which is called a learning tools for one note which has been um, helping empowering and enabling students with intellectual disabilities to overcome their learning barriers it helps in write comprehension reading abilities it has been improving and it is it has been even before these times and more so in current times when we're talking of getting more and more students to learn remotely organizations are adopting Uh, sorry the schools and educational institutions are adopting these technologies to help students go students uh, learn in fact just talking of uh, it comes naturally to me from microsoft i can talk about our own platform which is teams has has got such wide acceptance from institutions because uh, as i said students have to stay connected education has to continue we cannot sit back and say that okay these are the times when we 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 will just stop learning that's not going to happen we have to continue uh, it day in and day out uh, so teams has uh, really been adopted very well by the educational institutions and it's helping people because there are so many accessible features that are included as part of teams uh, which people are finding so useful in these times whether it is translation to to even help language barriers 
um, it, it really helps uh, kids to stay connected. So, so absolutely. And to your point, having the guidelines, I think that is the most, most important point because this is the right time. We have governments, organizations, NGOs, all of us work together towards having a, a standard because it has to start at the grassroots level. When we talk about the education challenges for persons with disabilities, uh, what do we need to do to make the standard education standard equal for everyone? So I think those guidelines are most important at this time, and uh, we must ad advocate for that and uh, work together to making that happen, make, make that a reality for India. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Krishna. I think uh, talking about guidelines, to be very honest, I think uh, both the government and the disability sector in India have, uh, for, the, for the longest time, focused more on physical infrastructure uh, rather than really digital accessibility. But uh, you interact with the government, you interact a lot with uh, persons with disabilities across the social sector too. Do you think uh, debates changing with digital accessibility conversations now both in the non-profit and uh, in the government? Absolutely, Nipun. And I think uh, if somewhere it is not, it is high time we start doing that. Because uh, we realize we are living in a new world. Uh, the only way forward, at least for another year or so that we are looking at, uh, social distancing is becoming a norm. Interactions have to be through technology. So I think it's high time we start talking about that. And how are we empowering persons with disabilities? Uh, we're empowering everyone with technology. So why leave persons with disabilities behind? So that's the most important uh, debate that we, we all must have. At Microsoft, a journey from accessibility to inclusion has been overwhelming for us. It's been enriching and, and uh, really a learning path for all of us. Um, this, this has been done in a way that creates um, a sustainable culture of accessibility that lasts beyond any of us. Uh, so I think once that culture, that groundwork is set, uh, the engine starts to move on its own. And that's what, when these debates, uh, like for years we've been having on infrastructure or buildings, things we, we saw we saw a change there so i think then same goes for technology the more we talk about it the more we demand because if you're talking of equality technology is one platform that can bring everybody on equal scale so i think it's high time we must talk about it right. creation of content communication consumption of the digital content is very very important and the debate must shift from how technology can and is unlocking the potential of persons with disabilities, whether either it is at a workplace or in classrooms or in their daily lives, creating independence for them and inclusion in, in the society. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Karishma. I'll come back to you towards the end. Uh, I'm going to go, go to our next panelist now, who is uh, Nidhi Goyal. Uh, she's a dear friend of mine. She's a both a disability and a feminist activist. She's the founder of Rising Flame. She's a national award winner. Nidhi, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Nipun, for having me here. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Nidhi, I wanted to start off by uh, really asking you, because there's a lot of people who would be curious to know what the government has done towards persons with disability, uh, for persons with disabilities during these challenging times, what it hasn't done, what it's done right, what it's done wrong. So could you give a brief overview for the audience here on what do you think are the challenges persons with disabilities facing? And where has the government gone right and where has the government gone wrong in that sense? Right. Um, thank you so much, Nipun. Uh, that's really important because I want to start by saying that these are very, you know, as Karishma said, and all of us um, obviously know that these are unprecedented times, right? Um, our government has done, you know, if you have a global comparison, the leadership in crisis has been really good and, and with with examples like Keshavji here, uh, we really know that private government partnerships, civil society and government partnerships are important more than ever before um, to take some of the work forward, right? Because we're all in a state of crisis. However, a few things that, um, you know, I would like to also just build a little bit of a context in terms of uh, persons with disabilities and, and then just take, um, take it forward where the government, you know, what was announced, what was not, what has been seen through what have still been the gaps, et cetera. Just to say that uh, Keshavji started with the call with uh, sharing some of the numbers of people with disabilities in the country. Uh, if you remember Karishma saying there are 1 billion of us across the world, if you see the percentages, we never were visible uh, 
in the country, right? The counting was very underdone. So now in such a situation where a crisis hits and you don't have the exact numbers of people with disabilities, you don't know who you want to support. So we really are starting from a space where we don't know where people with disabilities are. Um, it has been many civil society initiatives have come forward and said uh, numbers could be got from maybe the few people who have disability certificates, uh, maybe from the few people who went into uh, the accessible elections, uh, maybe from civil society and partnerships. So we're, we're starting from a slate where we're still looking for people with disabilities. Um, we're then moving to a space where all of us have so much of information around COVID and not always the right information because of the plethora of fake news that's around us. Um, but just even around the real news or the fake news, um, if you see we had you know, the prime minister's address or any other important announcements, you initially did not see any sign language interpreters while they were being spoken, right? Um, there were not many government initiatives that made information accessible for people with disabilities. So it's not just multilingual accessibility. You need easy to read accessibility for persons with intellectual disabilities and developmental disabilities to engage um, with the information or to absorb the information. We need sort of electronic accessibility or um, uh, electronic accessibility for blind and low vision individuals. We need sign language interpretation and captioning accessibility for deaf and hard of hearing because not everyone in the country knows sign language. So there are multi, multiple because disability is not a homogenous group. So we, we always need it and we continue to need it and it becomes imperative more than ever before in this crisis, in this situation of crisis to have access to information because unless you have that, you really do not know what even social distancing looks like. Uh, you would not know what is the spread of the virus. All of us sort of are still grappling with what this virus looks like, what will be the impact, but imagine the whole situation for people with disabilities. And there has not been too much of initiative from the government around access to information. Uh, while having said that, I think a lot of civil societies uh, took initiative to make um, accessible material for people with disabilities, including in simple languages and sign languages, etc. Um, one thing that's been really interesting around uh, support and accountability mechanisms, so we will hear from our department in a bit. Um, sir will come and share with us the very amazing guidelines that the department has come out with at the center, which is which are very inclusive, which are sort of almost policy level guidelines instructing the state. Now, what happens is that disability being a state subject, the implementation of any kind of guidelines falls on the state. In this scenario, it becomes even more difficult because in many states, the disability commissioners are not known. You know, the, the guidelines talk about nodal officers who could be contacted, but the information about nodal officers is not in the public domain. Or in some states, it's defunct. These positions are defunct. And so there's no lead, be, lead being taken by um, these kinds of officers who are in charge, who are being directed by the center. But also we see there's a gap in the accountability mechanism. So what we really urgently need is, you know, to accompany the directive around what pensions can be given to disabled people, what additional support. So the center has given, for example, um, thousand rupees of additional support, which roughly comes to, I think, 14 USD. Um, for certain sections of people with disabilities, which does not it's include children, effect. yeah, mm -hmm. which does not include children, and which does not include, uh, you know, it's only to a certain section, and those that dissemination of that amount is still a question. You know, it has not. If we see on the ground, the it has really not reached people with disabilities, and just if you think about reaching, you know, it will reach the bank accounts, right? We're talking about this amount being in addition to the disability pension that some disabled people receive. But what happens in the current scenario where you do have to, you have zero livelihood because many of them are daily wage workers. For example, there is a whole colony of blind hawkers uh, in near Mumbai, in Navi Mumbai, right? Um, when in the absence of daily wages and you're totally dependent on the pension. So in some states like Madhya Pradesh, the pensions have been advanced, but in other states, these practices have not been taken up. Um, these additional amounts have not been reached. The Jandhan amount has not been reached. And if they have reached, then people with disabilities are unable to access it because of the physical uh, you know, impairment of going to a bank, because of the uh, barriers that a blind individual would face around tactile issues. So we are all saying that, Yes, social distancing has become a norm, but we do not 
somewhere fathom how this social distance will play out is playing out currently for people with disabilities who need care and support in their daily lives, but who also depend on tactile touch like blind and deaf blind individuals for their, almost for their survival, right? And if we look at deaf blind community, there is no other way for, of communication for, you know, left for them. Um, I, sorry, Nipun, I'll just take a minute more to just uh, sure, put in a yeah. couple of points more. Um, so we're again talking about, you know, helpline. So you have set up a helpline. There are some such initiatives who have done city specific helplines, et cetera. There are some states who set up helplines in collaboration with disability commissioners. So I'm trying to give best practices first in Tamil Nadu, there has been a very proactive helpline set up. But again, the cases are not recorded. How many of those helplines actually the help has gone through? So the calls have been answered, but how many, you know, people have really benefited out of it. We do not have that data and that's not being recorded or at least not being shared. Um, in Maharashtra from where I am, um, you know, they set up numbers to call. And so immediately your question will be, how would deaf people even access that, right? Um, so helpline accessibility at each point, if we really go back to just the basic of access and accessibility and keeping that in mind, it becomes really, really important. There's an online form which not all people with disabilities can access that has been set up in Maharashtra by the Disability Commissioner. Uh, of course, the, the then comes the question about whether the people on the other side of official helplines are even sensitive towards needs of people with disabilities. And so there have been many recommendations from civil society uh, that have come up. I just want to leave with, uh, not leave, but end this response with two points around, uh, you know, technology is access, technology brings a lot of access in lives of people with disabilities, but we again see all the advocacy that is being done by group, blind groups, deaf groups, cross disability groups around digital access. You really now realize that if that was paid heed to, people with disabilities in this lockdown would be in a much better space. Absolutely. Access to entertainment. If you're deaf and you're at home, what is your access to entertainment? Netflix, but you should be privileged enough to have that kind of internet and that kind of money to buy a Netflix account where you have a closed captioning, right? Do our local um, cable channels, does the DD, does anybody have any accessibility for deaf individuals, even for entertainment, right? For Blind individuals are the food apps. We are all saying, okay, but you know, there are some online grocery deliveries accessible. Are all those apps accessible? Do they follow the web consortium accessibility guidelines? So I think it's time now, even more than before, to reinforce some of the asks that um, the disability sector or, or us disabled people have been putting forth in terms of visibilizing in numbers, in terms of adhering to access and accessibility guidelines, be it physical or digital spaces, thinking about access and what the challenges mean around that, and really coming to employment, thinking about the disability wisdom that existed, right? There were a lot of disabled people who asked for work from home as reasonable accommodation on days that, you know, they live with chronic illness and it were bad, those were bad days to travel or because the companies themselves had inaccessible infrastructure. And so it was really the ways of working. So maybe it's our time to learn from the disability movement and people with disabilities on the ways to work well from home. Just as a closing thought, because I work a lot on women with disabilities and, and that's been my decade long uh, work, um, focused on gender and disability, we're in the shadow of a second pandemic, which we don't realize violence, abuse, and discrimination, even more so with women with disabilities, happening overall with people with disabilities, it, it, the negative environment, those who have defunct families or non-functional families, or with the families who can't take the burden of care, uh, particularly which gets exasper exacerbated at this point, um, it's really the levels of violence has increased. We've seen cases of blind women being raped because their husbands were stuck somewhere else. We've seen some domestic violence cases which are coming up, but largely some of these issues will continue to be invisible because we as a group find it more challenging um, in our day-to-day -day interactions, um, you know, keeping things away from family while you're at home. So I'd just like to pause with that. Um, sorry, yeah, Nipun. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because, uh, you know, gender and disability, of course, uh, as many people say, the double disability in that sense is its own unique challenges. Uh, and I'm also glad that you spoke about digital accessibility because a lot of my blind and deaf friends are actually saying that even the Arogya Situ app, which has become mandatory, 
is not really accessible to persons with disabilities, which is kind of ironic in that sense. Um, I know Rising Flame in the recent past has been doing some work on mental health uh, during this lockdown too. So I actually wanted to ask you, is mental health a specific concern for persons with disabilities only its time? And uh, do you have any advice for the disabled community itself in how they can take care of themselves during these times in terms of mental health? Right. Thanks. Thank you so much. I completely forgot about that. Um, I just feel like when conversations again are happening around mental health, that the ways of these changes are going to impact um, everyone around. Uh, we need to also understand and acknowledge that vulnerable communities, and I say vulnerable communities with a lot of caution, because it's not just people with disabilities. If you look at the queer community, if communities, if you look at Dalit communities, if you look at any kind of intersections, right, who are queer and disabled, um, just becomes an even more traumatic experience. And I'd like to just give a couple of examples here. Um, for people with disabilities, many of them, because our emphasis in society is that you need to be completely independent, which is a very unrealistic expectation because the society itself is interdependent. So a lot of disabled people fought social barriers, infrastructural barriers, familial innovations to become independent. And what happens at this time when you're locked down it, it takes them back to their post-accident stages. It takes them back to the space where they were called dependent. It takes them back to the understanding that their own homes may not be fully accessible or accepting of their disability. And so the re-trauma or the trauma, tra trauma that people with disabilities are facing because of the lockdown, but even the uncertainty is far more exacerbated. Uh, and people with psychosocial disabilities, um, persons with aut like autistic persons, right? If you imagine who function very well on a structure or who need a structure to survive, um, when with such a disruption in routines and trying to find new normal and new structures, um, just the situation around mental health gets even more and more difficult. I think what is happening right now is that there are some online free services, and I am happy to share it on Figi. Right the call. Um, there are a bunch of services which we've also collated, um, which are offering free mental health services. What we did to counter this narrative, right? Because it's not about just people uh, working with psycho, you know, living with psychosocial disabilities or autistic persons or or people on the spectrum. It's about just people, uh, people with physical, sensory, other disabilities who are facing this mental health trauma. We started a series where we felt where we wanted to continue to feel connected and cut some of the isolation. So Rising Flame did that series of sort of public catch-ups or events um, in the month of April, which can be found more on risingflame.org. People can still access it. But there was huge interest because I think more also alongside therapy, we all need to see that there's a community which is with us, which is going through many similar things. Um, and there are many more issues you know, crisis will come and will go at some point, but there are many issues that we have to deal with and work alongside together. So I think that's been um, a very important uh, piece that we ran as Rising Flame last uh, last month. We're also launching because of the lack of data uh, from this Sunday, we're doing a series of online and telephone calls to gather more data around women with disabilities and their experiences and recommendations around the COVID crisis to deal with gender oh. and disability in a better way. Right, that's pretty interesting. Uh, you know, you spoke about technology and even Karishma has spoken about technology and uh, persons with disabilities for a long time have been propagating work from home. This is something you touched upon too. Uh, do you think COVID-19 in, in some ways could actually be a silver lining for persons with disabilities with companies now being more open to work from home even once we are past this crisis and do you think more jobs could open up for persons with disabilities? Correct. So I want to be positive, but I want to really say that it's a double-edged sword, um, Nipun. Uh, and I'm saying this with all honesty at the risk of sounding cynical to many individuals here or, or in our audience as well. I think it will open up jobs to a lot of people with living with diversities, right? Uh, including persons with disabilities, particularly because of you know, first there was a resistance to work from home. Uh, so if you were chronically ill and you said, oh, you know, I live with a disabling condition, I really need to work from home, or I need some days where I work from home. Uh, even for women, when they said that we, we were balancing and we needed some days, it was, wasn't seen really in a very great light. And I'm not talking about the leaders in the DNI, uh, DNI policies. There are many corporates who are leading here, but generally was not seen well. 
now what will happen with the work from home i definitely see opportunities increasing because next the next person with a disability who says can i have this flexible working arrangement it may not raise as many eyebrows um as it did before right and and the openness to this kind of accommodation would be there but my other issue is that this will also mean that it becomes into a situation where people with disabilities are forced to work from home where companies refuse to create access in their physical and infrastructural spaces because we see this it's a sense of comfort right a lot of diversity when diverse groups are not in physical spaces it's a huge comfort for people saying oh we don't have to deal with the stigma that we oh, we have we don't have to do self reflection we don't have to change our infrastructure why do we need to be accessible um and this is true for you know it will become true for burn survivor it will become true for uh definitely for trans persons as well and trans persons with disabilities because we don't fit the quote unquote normal and when it when it will when this will be start you know will will start being becoming the excuse of oh you don't fit into the normal but now nobody has to see you and nobody has to deal with you you're just this name on this online platform and if you can do you know if you can work from this online platform great we don't have to make any kind of other uh adjustments for you even towards the universal access it will become a negative experience for people with disabilities because social isolation will again kick in harder there so i think we should take it with a caution and with a pinch of salt um with or or just as a double edged sword to treat it really carefully around um this kind of balance for all vulnerable communities or communities which are generally not accepted in society no i think that's a very interesting point you made you know because even when uh, postal ballots in elections opened up for persons with disabilities so that they can vote a lot of persons with disabilities were celebrating that you know we can at least vote, we can vote from home but one also saw a few states lagging behind in making the election uh, offices accessible because they said that now you don't really need to come to an election booth because you can vote from home so i think it's a tricky balance and uh, the choice really needs to be with us right whether we want to work from home or go to the office instead of giving companies the shortcut of not becoming accessible in that sense uh nidhi i want to ask you one more question because there are a lot of persons with disabilities who are sitting in the who are attending this session you are ready uh what would your advice to be uh, to them be during these times and how do you think they should prepare for a new normal that might come up due to covid-19 so um one i'm very very nipun of us saying that a new normal is going to come I think for all of us, if we take collective action to craft a new normal, I think if it has, you know, this is an opportunity that nature or, you know, crisis has given us to craft a new normal, to sort of build a better society. So I think if first, you know, not just addressing people with disabilities, I think if all of us um, remember visibility, remember inclusion, remember diversity, remember accommodation, and build a new normal, that will be great. um i think for persons with disabilities i want to really give a very emotional message um you know i can say practically you could do this 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 reach out to uh, ngos or dpos for support uh, we're always there you're not isolated all of that but i want to just say um be calm be patient i think this time will pass um it's not easy there's still support um i i know the fears are really high around employment and and the sort of the rates at which people would be either asked to leave organizations etc and we always know that vulnerable populations are the first one to you know generally be gotten rid of uh, in those terms or are or are seen as additional costs to organizations um these are very difficult times but there are a lot of us who are working together to support each other i think reaching out is extremely important um for us again unfortunately the onus of reaching out the onus for of asking for support still falls on us we have still not shifted into this crafted new normal where you know the onus is and the burden is not always on us um the burden of care in our lives and our loved ones may have increased a little more uh because you know for various reasons you can't access the world you can't access a lot of things um i think it's okay i think the feeling of being unproductive can set in really soon uh, but i think no human being is not required no human being is unproductive i i just think we need to find more accessible and meaningful ways um to just live and exist and coexist and seek support in this world thank I you nipun i i just want to leave a 
the, just a you know thought for the future since we were talking about the new normal well, i have two worries um and which again is an appeal to the larger community i think we are moving towards the very eugenic idea of survival of the fittest be it at workplace be it in social life be it in policy spaces again there's a hierarchy of who matters whose need matters which needs matter i think it will take us back in many of our activisms as a woman i can tell you women's rights gone back 20 years um already we we are sensing that you know my work with the un and other spaces um i sit as an advisor there we're really concerned about going back in our advocacy i think we really need to be cautious around this whole new normal that we are hoping of the, or or we are moving towards already of survival of the fittest and hierarchy of people and needs so just a caution there for all of us to be more self reflective and intentional thank you thank you so much nidhi i think uh... I think that's really vibrating between you know, for all of us. I also want to bring Keshav in at this stage uh, because Keshav, I know at the Keshav Suri Foundation, you've been doing a lot of work uh, in mental health uh, for the LGBTQ community. Uh, what would your recommendation really be to a lot of persons with disabilities who are attending here? How can they keep the mental health intact during such a time? And uh, could you also briefly talk a bit about what your foundation has been doing in this space during this challenging time? So um, we are actually offering mental health uh, um, free consultation, not just for LGBTQ but for just society at large. Because I think mental health is uh, something that is so important, and yet as a society we kind of shrug it off. And uh, uh, right now, uh, keeping uh, keeping the current scenario in mind to stay positive can be very difficult. uh and i'm so glad that you and nidhi sort of brought that conversation up uh, i would like to of course take this further and just um, you know uh, work with whether it's government or any other private players to actually focus on uh, the mental well being of people and i know that fiki has uh, and under under uma ji also has a, a group that is focused on mental health it's really important because right now our minds can go into such dark spaces uh that uh, it's it's uh, you know it's difficult to kind of look into the bright side and that's why i would like to steer the conversation to see how we can be positive in making sure that again the the uh, um evils of the previous world don't continue and we actually start a better and a fresh new world with a with a positive uh, you know light right no i think that's very well said and do you have any message for the disabled community during this time i have a lot of messages for the uh, for the uh, people living with disabilities but uh, right now i would just like to say that you know we're all in this together uh, and uh, uh, whatever i can do in my personal capacity via the foundation i'm ready to do uh, and uh, i would really like uh, to hear from everyone what are the specific concerns that we can address right now in itself uh to be ease this uh, lockdown period and what are the concerns going forward uh that we will be able to uh to to be able to work together as because i think right now the situation is that everyone needs to come together for humanity's sake absolutely i think everybody has to come. yeah well said thank you so much keshav uh we have an expander who is now joined us aradhna lal of elementary hotel so with your permission i'll go to her Uh, Aradha heads uh, sustainability and energy affairs, and she's been doing a lot of work on hiring persons with disabilities and skilling them and employing them. So, Aradha, I had a few questions for you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, firstly, you know, I think uh, Keshav has mentioned a lot about what uh, Nareesh has been doing. Uh, Karishma mentioned what Microsoft has been doing in terms of uh, uh, persons with disabilities and interacting with them during such challenging times. But uh, you know, you play a steady HR slash sustainability kind of role, so. on a more generic way what do you think uh, organizations and the hr need to do while interacting with persons with disabilities during the times of covid-19 and how can they keep them engaged healthy and positive arada we can't hear you can't hear me yeah on check can you hear me now it says yeah. it's mute it's normal are you able to hear me now yeah 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 so i was saying it's very important at this time to consider how we should engage with our employees who are differently able and what is going on in their mind 
Now the lockdown has been on for a little over six weeks and out of our portfolio of 80 hotels, there are about 47 hotels that are currently not operating. And this is because they are located in a state where there might be a curfew, you know, going beyond the lockdown, there's a curfew. Or it might be where we have two, three hotels of lemon tree very close to each other. And since there is hardly any occupancy, we keep one running and we close the others for, for temporary uh, periods. So what happens with the staff then is that at the hotels that are operating, we are working with a much lesser number of staff than before. And at hotels that are not operating, naturally the staff is at home. So there's a lot of people who are currently at home. This includes people with disability and people without disability. So what we've done is our managers, the operations managers, like a restaurant manager, a housekeeping manager, a front office manager at our different hotels, along with the HR colleague and along with some of us from the corporate office, are doing video calls regularly. We are doing this on a weekly or a 10-day basis with those employees who are differently abled and who are at home. Because, you know, there's a lot of doubt in their mind. They are not sure, will my salary come? Will my job remain? What's going to happen to the hotel industry in the future? So there is a lot of doubt and fear. So what we found is that when our managers and all of us connect with our colleagues, you know, we do video calls sometimes as a group. Sometimes we do it one-on-one. -on -one, and we also involve the parents. So if we are talking to, uh, say, a colleague who is deaf, or we're talking to a colleague who's autistic, then we want to be sure that the parents are involved in that dialogue because it helps with the whole understanding of what is going on. And they also feel reassured. You know, there's two things going on. One is comprehension and one is the psychological impact. They also, the parents also feel better or the siblings when the hotel company talks to them and says, we, we are very, uh, you know, we are waiting for the lockdown to lift and we want our team members to come back. So they need to hear from us and they need to see us. Now, this is really interesting because people who are deaf especially, or even those who have Down syndrome or who are autistic, their whole connection is made visually, face to face with people, especially with their manager, their boss. So that's really important for them to get this kind of interaction. Also, we have worked on a new set of um, operations, standard operating procedures uh, for our different departments and for the back of the house. So there are some documents which we have shared with these colleagues. So when you give more information, when you provide clarity and you prepare some documents which describe that this is the way we are going to work in the post-COVID-19 uh, future, it makes them feel more assured and it makes them um, feel like they are understanding what's going on and they're a part of it. It's about being clear, it's about participation, and it's about somehow finding a way to remove that fear. So this is what we've been doing in the last few weeks. So open communication is what you are recommending, Radha. Yes, and visual as well as written, as well as text, or like whatever we can do in every way possible. Right. Uh, Radha, I have one more question for you, and then our uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Prabhu Seth, has joined us. So well. Right, right. So that, uh, that work from home is not really possible in every industry, and a lot of companies will now force complete hiring freezes, and in some cases, perhaps even layoffs <laughs> due to the economic shock. Yes. Do you think inclusive uh, hiring huh? is going to go for a toss in the coming months? Are you concerned about that as somebody who's worked in the industry sector? Let me be honest about how Lemon Tree is coping with the economic downturn. Uh, we've done, I think, I would say we've done three things. The first is we've tried to control every cost possible. And this is obviously the variable cost. So when it comes to the way we run the hotels, the supplies we buy, the way we manage the power, water, all of that, so we found ways to reduce cost in all the operating hotels. Hotels which are closed anyway, there's just a minimal cost of keeping it clean and so on. So that was one big exercise. The second exercise was how to address the manpower issue. Because if half your hotels are closed, there's no revenue coming, then how do you take care of a manpower bill, which is the largest component of your running cost? So here, uh, as a group, we decided that there will not be any layoffs. But the management team, which includes the senior leadership at the corporate office, as well as the uh, leadership at the hotel, all of us have agreed to take a very substantial pay cut. So starting with our chairman, he's taken a 100% pay cut for three months, April, May, and June. Uh, those of us who are in the senior leadership team, about maybe 20, 30 of us, we have taken a 66% pay cut. And the managers who are heading hotels or might be in the middle management level in the corporate office, have taken a 50% cut. 
So what this really means is you have found a way to reduce the entire wage bill of the company by 25% by taking these strong measures for the leadership team. So the choice was to say, do we start laying off people or do we take the hit in the senior leadership and therefore all the team members can stay? So that's what we chose. We chose the second option. Now going forward, the situation is that nobody can tell when the economy will re recover. There is going to be some amount of travel naturally. Some people are trying to return home. Some people have to go on business. But it will be nothing compared to the earlier levels of demand. And I'm sure Keshav would agree with this. But how do we cope in this near future? We we'll have to find some kinds of business. We we'll have to be flexible about our rates, etc. Plus, most important, we will have to set hygiene standards and cleanliness standards where the guest and the public feels comfortable and safe. You know, if they have a shadow of a doubt, firstly, they won't even get on a flight. Secondly, if they get on a flight, they won't land up at a lemonry hotel, you know, if they're not confident. So what we have been able to do, we've had a decent occupancy in the open hotels right now. So we have been able to show through evidence that the way in which we are keeping it hygienic and sanitized those guests are very comfortable. So if you see the kind of feedback those guests are giving right now, it's really powerful. It's really good. So when the lockdown will lift, we have set up a whole new set of SOPs. That work has taken us about 15 days. There's a new set of house rules for guests. So basically, the whole world has to engage with, with each other in a very new style. And a company like Lemon Tree is definitely ready for it. And I'm sure Keshav and his team are ready for it as well. Because travel is really the place where the fear will be the highest, you know, in the mind of the common person. So it's for us to stand up. And we are standing up, Nipun. I can assure you of that. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, and now, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Seed, for joining us. Uh, our keynote speaker and Chief Guest, Dr. Prabhu has now joined us. Uh, just to briefly introduce Dr. Prabhu Dr. Prabhu is the Joint Secretary of the Department of Empowerment of Persons with Disabilities. Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment. He has previously worked in various positions in the Income Tax Department as Assistant Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner, Additional Commissioner, and Commissioner of Income Tax in Delhi and neighboring areas. He is a 1989 batch IRS officer. And uh, in his current role as Joint Secretary, he has been very proactive in coming up with various circulars, notifications, etc., as a response to COVID 19. Uh, Dr. Seth will be speaking for around uh, 10 minutes, uh, giving his keynote address, and then we we'll open it up to questions. I have a few questions. I'm sure Nidhi, my fellow panelists from the District Council, mm -hmm. has a few questions and mm -hmm. take questions from the audience as well. So, Dr. Seth, over to you. Thank you, Nipun. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, to the esteemed panelists, uh, members of uh, Picky, uh, and dear friends, uh, good morning to you all. Uh, first of all, I would like to compliment, congratulate, and thank Picky for having organized such an important webinar during this COVID-19 pandemic. This seminar was a webinar was supposed to be had last week, but uh, due to circumstances beyond uh, everyone's control, it could not happen. So it's happening today. It has happened, in fact, already. The major part of the webinar is over. And I think uh, there must have been very fruitful discussions during this webinar. As Joint Secretary in the Department of Empowerment of Persons with Disabilities, I would like to give the perspective of the department while the entire country is in the grip of COVID-19 pandemic. We at the Department of Empowerment of Persons with Disabilities have been issuing instructions and guidelines relating to persons with disabilities, how to facilitate their working, how to make life and living easy for persons with disabilities during this COVID-19 pandemic. And not only are we issuing these comprehensive disability inclusive guidelines, but also, and more importantly, we have also been trying to instruct the implementing authorities to ensure that the implementation of these guidelines is proper so that the benefit percolates to the persons with disabilities. As regards these guidelines, I would like to tell you that on 25th of Mar March 2020, there was nationwide lockdown, which started uh, 
And then the very next day, that is 26th of March, 2020, we issued comprehensive disability inclusive guidelines. Now these comprehensive disability inclusive guidelines include a number of aspects, including priority to persons with disabilities in treatment, ensuring provision of food, water, medicines, and other essential commodities to persons with disabilities at their doorsteps, providing exemption to caregivers, maids, and other support staff for persons with disabilities from the provisions of lockdown and giving them some sort of passes during these lockdown conditions, sensitizing persons who are dealing with emergency situation about the rights of persons with disabilities, ensuring that all the material relating to COVID-19 pandemic the precautions to be taken by persons with disabilities are available in accessible format and also through sign language interpretation. Also ensuring that organizations of persons with disabilities are included insofar as measures for protection and reducing the problems and difficulties of persons with disabilities is concerned. In addition, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare has also issued comprehensive guide, guidance note on the 21st of April. Now, as regards the implementation of these guidelines, we sent letters to chief secretaries of states, to secretary, Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, secretary, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, to ensure that the information relating to COVID pandemic is provided in simple language, in accessible format, and also for the protection of persons with disabilities during this COVID pandemic. We also issued instructions to state commissioners of persons with disabilities to ensure proper implementation of these guidelines so that the benefit reaches persons with disabilities. We have written to other authorities as well, uh, like the Union Home Secretary, and also to a number of state agencies for ensuring that the guidelines which have been issued, the measures which are envisaged for persons with disabilities are properly implemented. While we are trying our best to ensure that the life and living of persons with disabilities is facilitated. We are also trying to see that these measures are properly implemented. We are aware of the fact that this is an unprecedented crisis and through active and collaborative efforts of everybody, we we'll try to ensure that persons with disabilities are, uh, their difficulties and problems are reduced to the minimum and they're able to cope with this pandemic. I think these are some of the measures in brief which we have introduced during this crisis. And uh, if you have any specific questions to answer, you are most welcome to answer those. I, I'll, you are most welcome to question me, and I will try to provide uh, satisfactory answers. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much sir, for answering, uh, you know, making that uh, address and I'm sure a lot of doubts are clear. But uh, of course, Nipun would uh, go over in terms of the participant questions and other questions from the panel. Thank you so much for uh, coming again today, sir, and, uh, you know, making this very important address because the participants were really keen on uh, uh, hearing the government and what the government's perspective is. So thank you so much for that. Uh, on behalf of Vicky, uh, I'm really thankful to you. And uh, Nipun, uh, over to you, uh, I think, uh, for the Q&A. Uh, Nipun is not audible. Yeah. Am I audible now, sir? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sir, uh, I have been receiving questions from a wide variety of persons with disabilities uh, uh, 
uh, throughout the last two days because we're very excited to hear from you. Uh, one of the questions I've received the most uh, often is that, uh, despite the fact that you've returned to the Department of Personnel and Training, a uh, lot of organizations, uh, government organizations, are still calling persons with disabilities to their offices to work. And I know the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment itself has written to a few organizations and told them to reverse the circulars, etc. But uh, so, why do you see this happening, and uh, what are you doing in the future to ensure such challenges don't come up? In fact, somebody in our own, uh, in this today's discussion also, somebody called Palmesh Parmar has written that he's a disabled employee of the government of Gujarat, and despite your circular, his regime is forcing him to go to office. And this is a common complaint amongst a lot of people. Well, as uh, uh, regards uh, the presence of persons with disabilities in uh, office, we have already written to the Department of Personnel and Training. And if you look at the comprehensive disability inclusive guidelines, it says that persons with severe disabilities and persons with visual disabilities, they should be exempt from essential services. So these are the two categories. And wherever we have found that there have been aberrations, we have, we have immediately taken action because they have certain specific problems like persons with the visual disabilities. It is very difficult uh, for them not to touch uh, various uh, things while they are interacting with the physical environment. And when they do this, chances of catching infection are very high. Similarly, persons with severe disabilities, uh, they, are, they will also be having a lot of problems insofar as uh, uh, attending office and other uh, duties is concerned. So for these two specific categories, we have mentioned in our comprehensive disability inclusive guidelines that even for essential services, these will be exempt. And wherever we have found such aberrations, we have immediately acted. Uh -huh. Right, sir. Sir, uh, another big challenge really is lack of uh, medicine and lack, lack of access to healthcare for, a, for persons with disabilities. Specifically, patients, for example, persons with thalassemia who need a lot of blood, or others with chronic uh, problems who need to go to hospitals, etc., for various kinds of treatments, etc. Uh, people like these are facing a big challenge. Are these kind of information uh, reaching the ministry? Do you have the data on the kind of challenges persons with disabilities are facing in that sense? And what is yeah. the plan going forward? Yeah, yeah. We, we are uh, uh, getting these type of complaints as well. But then uh, I would like to, uh, to bring to your notice the fact that the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare is the nodal ministry insofar as provision of medicines and blood transfusion is concerned. Now, on 21st of April 2020, a comprehensive guideline, guidance note has been issued by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. It is also available on their website. And that deals with various uh, chronic diseases, both communicable as well as non-communicable. And while dealing with these type of diseases, uh, disabilities, including uh, the blood disorders, thalassemia, sickle cell, and hemophilia have also been dealt with. Now, it has been mentioned in those comprehensive guidelines that uh, in case of all such chronic diseases, two, uh, three months medicine uh, will be provided to persons uh, who are having these uh, diseases and effort will be made uh, to the extent possible to provide these medicines and uh, other necessary equipment at the doorstep of persons with disabilities. So, and then it also states that uh, ASHAs will maintain regular contact with such persons and ANMs will be, will, will be maintaining contact with them at least twice every month. So all these things have been uh, mentioned uh, by, uh, in the guidance note issued by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. In fact, as regards uh, blood disorder uh, patients, uh, if you go through the guidance note, there is a specific column on blood disorders in which it has been mentioned that persons' uh, efforts will be made uh, to uh, inform the blood bank uh, to have adequate supply of blood for such patients. And also it talks of maintenance of e-rakht kosh for persons with, uh, uh, for persons with thalassemia. In addition, the, 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 minister, the Honorable Minister of Health and Family Welfare has written to all the uh, chief ministers of states to ensure that for persons with uh, blood disorder, thalassemia, sickle cell, and hemophilia, adequate supply of blood is maintained. So a lot of measures have already been taken, particularly with regard to the chronic diseases like uh, the, the blood disorders by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. We at the Department of Empowerment of Persons with Disabilities are trying to, uh, to ensure that through our State Commissioner for Persons with Disabilities and also District Social Welfare Officer, 
that these uh, these things are provided uh, to the extent possible at the doorstep of divyanjan so that this type of problem doesn't arise uh, right sir uh, so another challenge uh, of, or a fear that persons with disabilities have is that uh, if they go into a quarantine center or if they get covid 19 they might not have access to their own attendant or caretaker uh, and of course they are more comfortable with them, with their own personal attendant or caretaker and if they're unwell that that becomes even more important in that sense so is that something the ministry has thought about and uh, yeah in fact, if you go through the comprehensive disability inclusive guidelines, we have stated that during quarantine, also these facilities, including the facility of a caregiver, needs to be provided to persons with disabilities. Now, this we have issued these guidelines. Now, the implementation part is to be taken care of by the states. Now, states, we have written to all the chief secretaries of states. And then in states, we have a nodal officer. We have appointed nodal officer in the comprehensive disability inclusive guidelines. We have also given the mechanism for implementation of these guidelines and as per that mechanism at the state level there, there is a state commissioner for persons with disabilities and at the district level there is a district social welfare officer so the chief commissioner of persons with disabilities has written to all the state commissioners of persons with disabilities to ensure that these comprehensive disability inclusive guidelines are implemented and then at the district level the district social welfare officer has been sounded by the district administration while we, since we have already written to the chief secretary. So while this, it, this gets taken care of through our comprehensive disability uh, inclusive guidelines and also through the implementation machinery, which we have envisaged, but you know, India is a big country and here and there, maybe if there are some aberrations, then if we come uh, to, uh, if it comes to our notice, then we can immediately talk to uh, the state that concerned state commissioner of persons with disability and ask them to immediately take action so that this uh, th this uh, guideline uh, which we have issued is properly implemented. Right, sir. Uh, so, God of Singh, uh, who is attending this session, has asked the question that how accessible are the quarantine centers at the moment? Well, while uh, uh, the effort has uh, has been made to make the entire physical environment as accessible as possible, and we have been writing regularly about that. Uh, I think if there are some some issues, then I think these are being sorted out at the state level, so that the entire fiscal environment, be it in terms of the built-up environment or the, uh, the transport or information and communication technology, is made as accessible as possible. I would like to tell you that uh, we have uh, written to uh, uh, the uh, Secretary Information and Broadcasting, Secretary Health, that effort should be made to uh, have all facilities as accessible as possible. And when we talk all facilities as accessible as possible for persons with disabilities. I think, thank you so much for answering everything so openly. I have Nidhi, who is a fellow panelist, who also wanted to ask a few questions. So Nidhi, would you like to take over and ask two or three questions? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Nepon. Um, thank you, sir, for uh, really coming again on this call. and. Uh, from all of us, apologies for the last time again. Um, so we understand and we're really grateful for the uh, brilliant guidelines and really positive guidelines uh, that you've come up with as a department. We wanted to understand, sir, because disability is a state subject, we're really struggling with the to understand if there's any kind of accountability mechanism because one of complaints uh, reaching to you is another thing, but there are a collection of like a whole group of persons with disabilities who uh, face many challenges. And so I'll just club two or three questions together. Uh, one is about if there's any kind of accountability mechanism that is set to see if states are following these guidelines. Um, the second really is around, um, you know, uh, you mentioned the nodal officers and disability commissioners, and they're really in charge of putting things in place in, at the state level. But in many states, just the information around who are the nodal officers, um, how can one contact them? Those are not available very readily. In some states, disability commissioners are not active, are not reachable. Um, so what do people with disabilities do in those scenarios? Uh, I'm just going to pause here before I ask the next set of questions. Okay, so basically the questions which you have asked pertain to the implementation of the comprehensive disability inclusive guidelines. As uh, you rightly said, disability is a uh, state subject, so states have to uh, play a very important role. But then uh, at, uh, at the center, uh, the, the first and foremost step 
to be taken is to issue those guidelines because if there are guidelines for persons with disabilities, then only we can instruct and direct the state commissioners and uh, uh, and uh, the chief secretaries of various states to uh, implement those uh, guidelines. So that's why first and foremost on the 26th of March, we uh, issued comprehensive disability inclusive guidelines and uh, those uh, are, uh, have been widely publicized. These are available on our website as well. So these are quite comprehensive. While they talk of various, uh, uh, various types of safeguards for persons with disabilities, the mechanism for implementation of these guidelines has also been given. And I, as I mentioned earlier, at the state level, there's a state commissioner for persons with uh, disabilities who is the nodal officer. And at the district level, it is the district social welfare officer who is in charge of the uh, district and uh, uh, he or she is the repository of all data concerning persons with disabilities. So uh, this district social welfare officer is in the best position to implement any, uh, any uh, protective measure which has been introduced by way of comprehensive disability inclusive guidelines by our department. Now, as regards the implementation, uh, for implementation, we appointed nodal officers. Then uh, the first step was to, to uh, 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 the Secretary Department of Empowerment of Persons with Disabilities wrote to all chief secretaries of uh, states uh, for uh, ensuring proper implementation of these guidelines and for making the physical environment as accessible as possible for persons with disabilities. And then uh, the Chief Commissioner of Persons with Disabilities at the center wrote to all the uh, state commissioners of persons with disabilities uh, that these guidelines have to be scrupulously followed. So uh, we believe that all these state commissioners and uh, the district social welfare officers uh, uh, and other authorities at the district administration level are trying their level best to implement these guidelines. But as I mentioned earlier in response to one of the questions asked by Nippon, that ours is a uh, big country and there, are, uh, there may be some aberrations here and there. But then if you find any particular instance where, you, where there is uh, some, some uh, slackness on the part of nodal officer and uh, the grievance is genuine, then uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, grievance can be taken care of by talking to the concerned nodal officer and uh, asking them to, uh, to uh, improve their uh, machinery for uh, implementation of guidelines for persons with disability. So our endeavor is first by introducing these guidelines, by, by introducing these guidelines and then by writing to all the authorities in, uh, in, the, in different states of the country to implement these guidelines because that is very important. So uh, through these letter and, communica and communication, we are trying, we are endeavoring to ensure that these are uh, properly implemented. But if there is any, uh, any problem with regard to a particular state, then uh, that can be brought to our notice and then uh, or to the chief commissioner of persons with disabilities because one of the important mandates of the chief commissioner of persons with disabilities is to ensure that all the uh, all the uh, rules, regulations, and uh, uh, guidelines uh, issued by the department are scrupulously followed. So if that be the case, then the concerned st uh, state commissioner uh, will be sounded and action uh, and asked to take appropriate action. So, um, Dr. Sharma, uh, somebody has also asked uh, if we have uh, a particular helpline where these aberrations could be uh, uh, reported or also just writing to the department and writing to the CCPD would be, um, you know, would be then responded at an appropriate response rate. Um, and sir, I, I do understand you said the nodal officers and, and it's again, it's very important to come up with guidelines to even make those recommendations to the state and we really commend the department on doing so. Um, so just if the department can also put out the information around these nodal officers or circulate it or even put it specifically as a document up because people are also struggling. For example, we as a group, uh, you know, my organization Rising Flame with some other civil society members made submissions to Disability Commissioner in Maharashtra end of March, right after your guidelines came in. We've been trying to contact them since it's been a, very, it's, it's been a huge struggle, right? Because we also have some feedback for them. They've set up a landline uh, number for as a helpline etc and we didn't have any kind of deaf deaf people could contact that helpline so you know some of these instances at least we have the right contact numbers or a way to contact the nodal officers disability commissioners district welfare officers so this is a request sir and the question is um is there a specific helpline to contact the government about the apparitions that are happening at state levels 
Yeah, in fact, most of the state commissioners are persons with disabilities. If you go to their side, you will find uh, uh, various okay. numbers there. So you can, uh, anybody Not having either. a grievance can contact them on that number and uh, try to yeah. get the grievance redressed. So that is the first, uh, first step. And I think most of the uh, grievances can easily be uh, redressed at that level. And that's the more uh, effective level because they have lesser number of cases to deal with. They are concerned only with one state rather than uh, the entire country, as is the case with us. So I think they should, first of all, be approached. And if you go to the website of most of these state commissioners, almost all state commissioners, you'll be able to get uh, various uh, telephone numbers and you can dial those numbers and, uh, and, and ensure that any problems uh, which uh, PWDs are uh, uh, facing get nipped in the butt. But if still uh, you find that uh, the grievance has not been addressed, then you can write to us and we'll see uh, how, uh, how uh, such grievances can be taken care of. Thank you so much, Nidhi. So we have another question Nidhi, from uh, our, uh, Nidhi, there are a few more questions. Not from me, just the, yeah, OK, great. Thank you. Sorry, there's another DNI member, so I just thought uh, the question yeah. should be flat. Oh, so okay. you can ask that question and then hand it back to me. You can go ahead with that last question. No, no, it's in the chat, Nippon, so you can take it forward uh, as and when you get it. Whose question are you referring to? Um, Apoorv has asked a question from the but disability what is that question? Of the yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir, for all your responses. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah, uh, sir, uh, Karishma from Microsoft is here and she wanted to ask the question and then I'll, okay. I'll go to you after that. Yeah. Yeah, Karishma. Yeah, thank you, Nip. Good afternoon, sir. I think uh, great address. Good afternoon. Great address. I'm glad to have you again with us. I think it's a great opportunity for us to be here together on a platform that Vicky has provided us to collectively discuss the issues that we as a, as a community are facing at this point. Uh, uh, it's, um, it comes naturally to me, but uh, I think I also completely believe that there are no limits to what people can achieve and technology reflects the diversity. Uh, your voice is not clear. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yeah, now it's better. Okay. Can you be a bit louder? Yeah, I'm saying there are no limits to what people can achieve when technology reflects the diversity of everyone who uses it. And as Microsoft and other organizations at this point are uh, trying their best to see how technology uh, can help uh, persons with disabilities and everyone in this situation where people are working from home. Uh, how do you think, uh, how does government see technology playing a role here in these trying times and bringing people together and really creating a better free environment for everyone, people who are facing yeah. these challenges? That's a very good question, in fact, Karishma, which you've asked. And uh, um, I would like uh, to take this opportunity to inform you that uh, we are trying to make use of this technology and uh, through our national institutes, uh, there are nine national institutes, as you may be aware of, and around 20 composite regional centers. And uh, I'm looking after the national institutes in the department. So uh, we are encouraging all the national institutes to uh, have these webinars uh, on different subjects relating uh, to their field of specialization and any other area which can be uh, of use to persons with disabilities. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to inform you that last week, uh, we, uh, uh, one of our, our national institutes, that is National Institute of Mental Health Rehabilitation, so it's in fact uh, has just started with a skeletal staff of uh, seven, eight persons. And I am uh, uh, right now the director of that institute as well, apart from being the joint secretary in the department. So last week, in fact, we hosted uh, uh, four webinars uh, on uh, mental stress and uh, uh, anxiety relating to COVID-19 pandemic because we are finding that a lot of persons, not only persons with disabilities, but other persons as well, are having uh, mental health uh, issues, uh, depression, stress, and other uh, symptoms and anxiety because of uh, the lockdown and other conditions associated with it. So we hosted uh, four webinars and they were very well, uh, uh, they were very well received. And then uh, uh, the our uh, the, uh, the National Institute for Persons with Physical Disabilities, which is located at Delhi, uh, hosted a webinar on, uh, on other important issues relating to physical disabilities like hair, neck and shoulder pain, osteoarthritis, then problems uh, which CP children are facing and autistic children are facing, 
And again, uh, in fact, the capacity of uh, Google Meet is 250 and the entire capacity was exhausted. And uh, that was again very well attended. In our Mumbai Institute, Ali Awarjan uh, National Institute of Speech and Hearing Disabilities, uh, we organized a webinar uh, relating to cochlear implant. And that uh, was attended by more than 1,500 uh, participants. So through these uh, webinars, we are trying to disseminate information relating to COVID-19 pandemic, relating to problems with persons with disabilities are, are facing, particularly during these difficult uh, times of COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, in addition uh, to that, we are also uh, trying that uh, some sort of home-based uh, uh, courses can be uh, started by home-based rehabilitation models can be started uh, by the National Institute for Persons with uh, Disabilities and also for their parents and caregivers. So that while being at home, uh, persons with disabilities and their parents and, and caregivers can make use of technology and uh, while sitting at home, can take the benefit of uh, uh, rehabilitation uh, uh, works, which are being uh, rehab rehabilitation services, which are being provided online by the uh, national uh, institutes. So through uh, dissemination of information, through uh, online rehabilitation uh, works, we are trying to make use of technology uh, for uh, uh, easing the life of persons with disabilities. I would also like to take this opportunity to, to inform you that during this COVID-19 pandemic, all our nine national institutes and composite regional centers remained open. They did not, they were not shut down even for a single day because our priority is to provide rehabilitation services to persons with disabilities. And even during this COVID pandemic, these services should continue to be provided. So what, whatever number the people were coming, all of them were uh, provided rehabilitation services. Great. I think, um, thank you so much. Uh, this is helpful. Uh, I think that's what we believe the technology is a biggest enabler at this time, especially yeah. when we all are working from home. And I was talking about it uh, earlier also that uh, there couldn't be a better uh, time, especially for persons with disabilities, because uh, the barriers for everyone are equal right now. We all are working from home. We all need technology. And I think we should make the most of it. Uh, so thank sure. you for your answer. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Krishna. Uh, I want to next head to uh, Mr. Keshav Suri, who is the chair of our PK DNI committee, and also, and he had a question for you, sir. Sure. Sir, thank you so much for joining us again uh, today, and I hope you get an opportunity to go through the recording and uh, see the discussion. Uh, you know, once we're done with this call, because there were some very interesting uh, points and uh, uh, great suggestions. Um, so I had a particular question. Uh, the Lalit works very closely with acid attack survivors, and uh, we wanted to know: Are they also covered in the uh, PWD guidelines issued by the government? Yeah. Uh, again, a very pertinent question which you have asked. And here, in fact, I would just like to make a distinction between the earlier PWD Act of 1995, where we had seven disabilities and acid attack victims were not a part of disability. So yeah. when they are not a part of the act, then they will not be covered by various schemes, policies, programs, or whatever guidelines uh, we have been issuing from time to time. Now, uh, one major reform undertaken by the department was the passing of Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act of 2016, which eventually got implemented on the 19th of April, 2017. And a major uh, characteristic or a major uh, important thing about the RPWD Act is the increase in the number of disabilities from 7 to 21. Earlier, we used to have seven disabilities, and now there are 21 disabilities. And acid attack victims is one of the categories of persons with disabilities. So whether it's the scheme for uh, uh, physical empowerment, economic empowerment, educational empowerment, social, psychological empowerment of the department, acid attack victims automatically get covered by this and also by the guidelines which we have issued on the 26th of March, 2020. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. So I know we've taken a lot of your time, but I want to ask you one more question, which uh, which is coming from our Fikki DNM, sure. uh, Apoor Kulkarni, who is uh, part of Ola Mobility Institute. Uh, and it's a long question, so I'll read, please, uh, I'll, I'll read it out. I'm a part of the global Stanford community, which gives me a unique vantage point to spot early trends. Businesses are exploring 
automating various operations for hygiene, cost management, and business continuity in a post-COVID world. Lower-end and process-driven jobs where significant number of persons with disabilities are employed are prime candidates for automation. Uh, could the Joint Secretary please uh, suggest how to encourage corporates in balancing the business need for rapid automation, diversity and inclusion for persons with disabilities, and equal opportunity to marginalize communities? Can you, so can you repeat the last sentence? Can you re repeat the last question, the last sentence? Uh, so basically, I think what he's trying to ask is that automation uh, businesses will go in towards a lot of automation in these coming times. And a lot of uh, states, etc. are also changing the labor laws, etc. as we've seen in the news. This persons with disabilities could be one of the vulnerable communities because of this that might lose jobs. So is the ministry thinking of any way to protect employment of persons with disabilities during these challenging times? Well, uh, we, in fact, uh, as uh, you may be knowing, we have the National Action Plan for uh, Skill Development, where our endeavor is to, uh, to uh, uh, provide skilling to persons with disabilities. And not only to provide skilling to persons with disabilities, but in the changing world, also to seek employment avenues for them. Now, with COVID-19 pandemic, uh, a new uh, challenge has come in front of us. And the challenge is that in changing times, in the times of COVID-19 pandemic, how to uh, change the uh, uh, ch change uh, the uh, skill training programs so that in the, these changing times with more and more use of technology, how can persons with disabilities make the most of the change uh, the, uh, the the courses, different courses, online courses in particular, where technology can be made use of, and through online courses. They, they can acquire certain skills which can later on be utilized by the employer in providing various uh, employment opportunities to them. Now, for that, first of all, we have to find out what are the employment avenues available. And there are three links to it. One is the uh, analysis of demand in the market. Second is the, uh, the uh, provision of appropriate skill set to match with the demand. And the third one is provision of credit facilities. So, in fact, we at the Department of Empowerment of Persons with Disabilities, as well as our uh, public sector enterprises, the National Handicap uh, Development and Finance Corporation, as well as the Artificial Limb Manufacturing Corporation, are trying to find out as to how we can have a skill, uh, we can have such skill set uh, developed for persons with disabilities, which can be uh, in conformity with changing times, which can take care of the immediate uh, uh, and at, at, at the same time, can take care of their financial requirements by providing loans to them at concessional rate of interest, so that once they acquire the skills, they are able to 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 uh, get loan at concessional rate of interest for uh, uh, equipments related to their self-employment opportunities, and then they uh, uh, and then they can become self-employed or also get some wage employment. So we are trying to see as to what sort of changes we can introduce in our online courses so that maximum number of persons with disabilities get adequate skills, which in fact can lead to their employment. Thank you so much. I think that's a very valid point. Uh, another question that's actually come in is, is for, uh, this is the last question I promise sir. I know you can, uh, we've really taken a lot of your time. Uh, sir, how is she linking with MSME for supporting entrepreneurs with disabilities and including them in any deep measure to make them revise? You spoke about uh, giving loans to persons with disabilities. Is there anything else that's on the lines? Uh... Well, uh, I think if you look at the employment avenues, then what are the basic hurdles which persons with disabilities face? Number one, the, they find it difficult to get the appropriate skill sets. Second, if they acquire skill sets, they are not able to uh, get employment because employment is somewhere else. And thirdly, if suppose they want to go for self-employment after acquiring skills, they do not have the necessary financial resources in order to finance the, uh, the purchase of certain equipments which are necessary for enabling them become self-employed. So that's why through a collaborative effort, through collab which will also include the National Skill Development Corporation as well as our uh, national institutes, plus the panel training partners, various NGOs, National Handicap Finance and Development Corporation and LMCO will try to, uh, to to have such a scheme 
which can not only provide skills to persons with disabilities, but can provide them employment because that is the bottom line. Right. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you so much for your time. Uh, I know the it, minister... it was a pleasure interacting with you all. Uh, I know into positive of time, I told uh, Uma that I'll be giving half an hour, but I think I have already exceeded that. But it was uh, a wonderful uh, interaction. And I thought that uh, whatever the department is doing, you people should know. And one uh, small request which I would like to make is that through this forum and uh, through your organizations, you should try to disseminate the message of the department to as many number of people as possible. Because see, in this COVID pandemic, it's not only the government. Uh, government will try its best. When we, I, when we talk of government, is the central government, the state governments. But then the non-governmental organizations, the uh, other uh, organizations should also collaborate with the government in order to take this message as as for the as as far as possible, so that uh, the persons with disabilities get the benefit which are aimed at those people. Thank you so much, sir, and uh, totally assure you that we at FICI and uh, especially through our diversity and inclusion uh, task force, uh, we are collaborating with uh, uh, both industry and civil society organization and government. We are right there. And like you very rightly said, I think we are all in this together and we have to, I think, uh, go through every issue together. Uh, so, so you have our support totally. And uh, we are so thankful that the ministry and the department is so accessible and, uh, you know, ready to solve all the queries that we have. So, again, uh, thanking you so much, sir, for uh, taking out time and coming again. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, sir. Thank, thank you, Uma, for uh, giving me the opportunity to interact with you all. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, before I hand over to Umaji for the formal vote of thanks, I also would like to thank everybody in the audience for the attended, and I would like to tell them that uh, a lot of people on this panel who are doing a lot of cool work, so do follow them on social media. Uh, for example, I know Keshav Suri Foundation is doing a lot of interesting stuff, including Valentine, which I've been a part of on the Facebook page. They also have their own DJ who's on a wheelchair, Varun Fuller, who's performing on the Facebook, Facebook page itself, so that's pretty cool. Nidhi spoke about Rising Flame and uh, the fantastic work Rising Flame is doing. Do follow them on social media. You put, uh, uh, look at Microsoft Enable Twitter handle, Levin Tree. You could, if you want, you could also follow me because I think I'm trying to do some work. So you could look at Nippon Foundation and people's life. And uh, with that, thank you so much, everybody, for attending. And I would like to hand over to everybody to propose a formal vote of time. Yeah, so uh, thank you, everybody, for taking out the time and uh, the second time over. Thanks a lot for all of you joining and uh, attending this. And thank you, all the esteemed panelists, for taking out time and addressing. Uh, what I would like to tell uh, all the participants is if any of your questions are unanswered or if you have any issues post the webinar, please feel free to write into Fiki 